Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today, we have two brand new crazy revenge stories for you. The first story will tell us how important to clean up the garbage because you can get in trouble because of it. And before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, leave comments so we know what kind of stories you love the most. Steal my bin? Ha! Lose your home. Background. I live in England and my flat is owned by a housing trust, meaning it's a rented public property. Basically a council flat. I moved in last November and the first thing I did was go down and meet my downstairs neighbor. Our flats are an old house converted into flats. We both get a front door and our own front and back gardens. I have the upstairs flat, meaning I get a little downstairs storage space and then a nice upstairs flat and gate into my back garden. Downstairs flat doesn't have inside storage space, but they get two sheds in the back garden and a back door. My flat is directly atop theirs, even though our doors are side by side. Anyway, I move in and go to say hello to the neighbors, I introduce myself and explain that I have TV and music on every hour that I'm in for mental health reasons, I can't sit in silence, and of course I'll try and keep it quiet. But this is a new flat, noise levels will be different to where I lived last, and if it's too loud just come bang on my door and naturally I'll turn it down. My neighbor, we'll call her Charlotte from now on, smiled and nodded and assured me that it'd be fine. They're a little loud too and the same goes for if they keep me up. With that done, I head back up to my flat, feeling good that my neighbors were nice people. Well, I'm sure I'll be wrong again, too. I parked my wheelie bin by the fence that divided our front garden at first, and I noticed that her bin was full to bursting and wondered if that was a common problem or just because Charlotte had a massive clean-out. That was until I go to put my own bin bags in my wheelie bin and find it full, with the exact same bags that she uses. Not black bin bags, but yellow ones for some reason. Very distinctive. I brush it off, fine, annoying, but whatever, and I move my bin to the bottom end of my garden by the gate so it's easier for me to put out on bin day. This works for a month, then I catch the flu. I put the bins out before it hit me hard so on bin day and the day after I couldn't get out to put my bin back in my own garden. I get better, go to fetch my bin, and find it's in my neighbor's garden, full. There's no way it could be a simple mistake because my bin is covered in stickers because I'm a grown up and I like stickers. Anyone that would look at it would go, oh yeah, that's Cheshire Kitten BDP's bin. So I start to plot. First stop, wait till she puts the bin out, drag it back towards my flat and get it back in my garden. The second, the bin men are done because I can't afford the fine from the council to get a new bin. And for the kicker, I noticed while hanging out washing in our backyard and rescuing my inside kitty when she fell out the kitchen window, that her back shed is full of bin bags. And it was now spilling over into the garden. Our back garden is steadily filling up with trash, and Charlotte rarely, if ever, puts out her bins. And her one is full to bursting still, her recycling boxes are overflowing with dishes in one case for some reason, so it's a pretty easy assumption that she's just tossing her rubbish out into the back garden rather than dealing with it. So it begins. The Revenge. I'm on the panel for the area where I live, where the residents of this housing agency's homes can air complaints and help decide where the money's spent. I bring it up there, in a nonchalant, will it stop the cut you promised me of my back garden that's full of rubbish? That's when the conversation moves on, and I'll leave it. I start taking pictures of the back garden, of her front, and forward them to my housing officer. The trash mountain still steadily growing and growing. My housing officer comes around and slips into the back garden through my gate with the premise of examining for the cut, then sends her a warning letter. He later tells me that she claims the trash was there when she moved in, and since there's no proof to the contrary, they'll just come and clear it out. Right, I think. I'm gonna freaking get this. So I make friends with the family whose garden borders ours, where our fence panel is blown over, leaving a nice gap. And there I hide and wait. Their kids think I'm hilarious because I sit in one spot in their garden and just stare at my own garden. The adults understood. They lived in council properties all their lives and completely understand bad neighbors. Then, after three days of sitting there all day and into the night, I finally get what I want. A quick video of her opening her back door and throwing out rubbish bags. Not the neon yellow ones, the black ones that match the trash pile already there. Jackpot. I snap a few pictures of the pile, thank my new friends, and head home to email the video to my housing officer. Two days go by, I've heard nothing, but that's normal. This is a society of red tape. 
I had a feeling it'd take a while, but I was feeling gleeful already. A week goes by, another, then suddenly we're in February and I'm starting to think that maybe nothing's gonna happen. Until I get awoken by a banging and clattering downstairs at 10 a.m. I grumble and huff and head out to look out my front window and lo and behold, white van and they're carrying out furniture. I check my emails and there's one from the housing officer. Thank you for your help. Steps were taken and ignored. Final action being taken or, or something along those lines. Success. So I made myself a cup of tea and sat on my couch by my front window, gleefully watching them load up the white van. I even give a little wave when they notice me watching them, full on crap eating grin on my face. Aftermath. Back garden has now been cleaned. Flat is now occupied by a lovely girl who I've spoken to on occasion and given the same explanation of noise. Still not heard anything on that, so I guess my noise level isn't so bad. And we chat if we're both hanging our washing out at the same time or something. Don't know where Charlotte's gone, but I bet it's private, since if you get kicked from a housing association property, you aren't getting another one. Lesson, don't mess with my Ben. And our second story. Refuse to pay? Feel the credit pinch. First of all, this happened way back in 2002, and to a colleague to me, who referred the story to me. This happens back in a time where there were still a lot of people that thought of IT and programming as the pastime of nerds and not real work. I worked at a call center doing internet support and had a colleague that ran a development business on the side, trying to build it to support him. He got an order for a small program from a large power company, revenue around $500 million, by far the largest company around. A price was agreed, contract drawn, he had lawyers and his extended family that helped him draw up a good standard contract and signed by an authorized part in the large power company. He developed the program, delivered it, and got a sign-off that he had delivered to satisfaction. Then he sent the bill, and he didn't get any money. He contacted the manager who'd signed the contract who said he'd authorized the payment, but that it was stuck with his manager. The higher manager had looked at the bill and basically said, this is not real work, we're not paying. The fact that my colleague was 18 in a one-man business and not even full-time probably made him think he could get away with it. My colleague sent reminders of his invoices, but did not get the money. When he finally managed to get through to the hire manager and was told that they would not pay, he threatened action to which the hire manager replied something, well, you can try, we have a legal team and a lot of resources. My colleague, fuming, did not admit defeat though. Instead of suing the large power company in civil court, which would have taken time and been expensive, he went to courts and started bankruptcy proceedings against the power company. He knew he'd have no chance to win as the company had plenty of assets, but he had his contract and his invoices, which was enough evidence to start bankruptcy proceedings. The problem for the power company, they traded electricity and heating production certifications and CO2 permissions a lot, as was and is standard among power companies here. And just having bankruptcy proceedings against them affected their credit score, potentially costing them millions in interest and higher pay for certifications and permissions as other companies and authorities would be less willing to sell a company with a non-AAA credit rating. My colleague was paid very quickly with the understanding that he would withdraw his bankruptcy request, which he did. Wow, makes a great David versus Goliath pro revenge story. And our last story, a revenge twofer. These events took place over 15 years ago at the large rail car repair shop where I worked. I was in a different department from all these folks, so I was an observer rather than a participant. The shop got a brand new head boss, and this guy was a total jerk. Slightest infraction of the rules would earn the guilty party a three-day suspension from work. A good example of this would be coming back from lunch a few minutes late, which was all too easy to do since the sandwich shop across the street was always very busy with long lines. Obeying the rules did not apply to the boss, though. It was soon noticed that he was frequently off the property for no legitimate reason. Also, the stock clerk let it be known that he was ordering all sorts of construction material through the company that was of no use in the shop. Some of the mechanics took to tailing him around with a camera. What they discovered and documented was this jerk was using the materials ordered through the company's stock system for projects on his outside business. He was let go. No surprise there, after two decades in the job, with a complete loss of his pension. Actually, the company was lenient. It declined to prosecute. Now for his number two man, who was an even bigger jerk and having seen what happened to his boss was twice as stupid. 
There was a company-wide policy against working on private vehicles on company property, even when one was off the clock. Since we were all mechanics, the temptation was very great. Some people were discovered doing so and were punished. This jerk went beyond working on his own vehicle. He set up a word-of-mouth auto repair shop on the property. Like boss number one, he acquired his tools and repair parts through the company's stock systems. Everybody in the building knew it. Now our payroll clerk's wife was in the last stages of terminal cancer, and the clerk had to take frequent sick days. He had plenty banked up, so he wasn't ripping off the company to care for her. He was harassed unmercifully, forced to stay late, and forced to do jobs outside his classification. That was the last straw. Time for payback. Same result. The mechanics documented everything on paper and with photographs. When company investigators showed up, they discovered a cargo container crammed full of heavy machine tools and auto parts, all of which had been ordered through the company stock system. He was fired too. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video to the end, and I'll see you in the next one with more great stories and crazy people.